Beloved, we're back in the prophet Isaiah this morning. Uh, if you remember, a while back I already preached to you from uh, Isaiah 44 about uh, God pouring his spirit out, out upon our, our descendants there. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to leave that in your memory. You'll have to go back and, and look at, uh, at the website if you want to hear that sermon again. And then there's a section on the fo folly of idolatry, which, uh, which Isaiah has uh, treated quite a number of times already. So we're, we're going to leave that one lay there, and we're, we're working our way up to chapter 45 this morning here, where it talks about Cyrus there. And uh, so I'm going to uh, begin reading. Uh, I'm just going to read our sermon text this morning, and then we'll, we'll read some other sections of that as well. Let's begin with 45 uh, at the first verse there. This is God's word. Thus says Yahweh to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him, and to loose the belts of kings and to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places that you may know that it is I, Yahweh, the God of Israel, who you call by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Beside me there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds rain down righteousness. Let the earth open that salvation and righteousness may bear fruit. Let the earth cause them both to sprout. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to him who strives with him who formed him, a pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or your work has no handles? Woe to him who says to a father, what are you begetting? Or to a woman, with what are you in labor? Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, the one who formed him, ask of me, Ask of me things to come. Will you command me concerning my children and the work of my hands? I made the earth and created man on it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens. I commanded all their hosts. I have stirred him up in righteousness, and I will make all his ways level. He shall build my city and set my exiles free not for price or reward, says Yahweh of hosts. Thus says the Lord, the wealth of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush, the Sabaeans, the men of stature, shall come over to you and be yours. They shall follow you. They shall come over in chains and bow down. They will plead with you, saying, Surely God is in you, and there is no other, no God besides him. Truly you are God, who hides himself, O God of Israel, the Savior. All of them are put to shame and confounded. The makers of idols go in confusion together. But Israel is saved by the Lord. With everlasting salvation, you shall not be put to shame or confounded to all eternity. For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, he is God who formed the earth and made it. He established it. He did not create it empty. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is no other. 
I did not speak in secret in a land of darkness. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in vain. I heard, I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. Let's pray. Lord, open your scriptures again to us this morning. Your word, which is so powerful in our midst, even though written hundreds, thousands of years before our time, yet it is living and sharp as any two-edged sword and pierces right to the middle of our souls. And so speak, O Lord, as we have sung. In Jesus' name, amen. You remember back in uh, chapter 43, God said, Even from eternity I am he, and none can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? This uh, particular section that we're on uh, centers heavily around verse 1 there, where it says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, if you go back a, a few verses into chapter 44, uh, we'll catch some more of that context, uh, picking it up there. It says, I am the Lord who has made all things. I am back in verse 24. Who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of liars and makes fools of diviners, who turns wise men back and makes their knowledge foolish, who confirms the word of his servant and fulfills the counsel of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited, inhabited, and the cities of Judah, they shall be built, and I will raise up their ruins. Who says to the deep, be dry, I will dry up your rivers. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. He shall fulfill all my purpose. Saying to Jerusalem, she shall be built, and of the temple your foundation shall be laid. Now we look at, back at this from, from our perspective, but you have to think about it in terms of when it was written. Remember, if we went to the back, to the front of the book of Isaiah, Isaiah prophesied during the kings of, of uh, Judah there, and none of this had happened. They hadn't been carried away to Babylon yet. The city was not completely razed to the ground. The temple was not burnt with fire and destroyed. And they had not been carried away to captive in Babylon. That was all still coming. And yet he writes even further on into the future and calls a specific man by his name Cyrus who nobody even knew about. In fact, all the liberal theologians say he, this was written sometime later. Because how can Isaiah prophesy about a man who's never even been born? And yet he does. He looks off into the future. He sees the captivity. He sees the destruction of the city. And, he, and he, he sees even beyond that 70 years to the end of that Babylonian captivity. And to this man here, Cyrus. And he says, he's going to do my will. He's going to do what I say and he's going to bring the captivity, captives back from Babylon and he's going to rebuild the city. And you can read all about that if you want to this afternoon in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. That this King Cyrus is used by God to bring his people back. But what's astounding about it is that as is said there in, in the text in a number of places... He's not even a believer. It says, it says there in, in two places that you don't even know me. Uh, look at verse 4. You do not know me. I name you, though you do not know me. Verse 5. I equip you, though you do not know me. God is using Cyrus as a tool in his providence. He's not even a believer. 
And this is one of the, the things that is a sort of mysterious about the providence of God. That he all the time is using events and people in this world, even people that, he, that do not know him, to perform his will to make things happen for the sake of his people. That's what he says. I'm doing this for two reasons. One, for my people, and that you may know that there is no other God in this world. That's the work of providence in this world. That's why we can say in Romans 8, 28, and we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. For those God, whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers. And to those he predestined, he also called. And to those he called, he also justified. And to those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him freely give us all things? The work of God's providence, his workings in this world goes on. It's always went on in the world. And it's always went on <clears throat> in a sort of a mysterious way for, uh, for us to comprehend. That we may know him and that we may know he is at work on behalf of his people. He says in verse 7 of our text, these words, I bring, uh, I, I form the light and create the darkness. I bring prosperity or well-being and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. You see, it's not just in the prosperity of the working of God that his kingdom comes, but also in the calamities. Of life, that the kingdom God of God goes forward. Now that's something we don't want to hear, frankly. You know, sure, we all want to hear that God creates prosperity. We all want to hear that He's going to bless us and He's going to do good things and, and His kingdom's going to come forward. But we don't want to hear these other words. That Isaiah writes, I also create calamity. I create the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. I create the destruction of, of the temple itself. I create 70 years of captivity in a foreign land. I have done that as well. And that also drives forward the kingdom of God. And so when we, in, in, by way of application, when we, we look at the world around us today and we say sometimes, and this is an erroneous saying, it's out of control. Well, maybe from a human perspective, we understand that. Okay. But from a biblical perspective, we need to take a step back from that and say, no, it's not really out of control. It's just happening in a way that we don't understand. That God is working his plan and, and bringing his kingdom to pass in a way that is mysterious to us. And that's here in this passage as well. Look at uh, verse 15 here. It's, uh, it's part of the the paradox or the, the quandary, you might say, of providence. In verse uh, 15, it says, Truly you are a God who hides himself, a God, a Savior, a, a God of Israel, the Savior. Notice that phrase. You are a God who hides himself. Well, I think that needs to be understood in the context here of things that happen which we don't understand. I mean, how can we understand God 
using such a tyrant as Cyrus to be his instrument to help his people. I mean, Tyrus was as brutal as all the rest of the dictators that have existed in the history of the world. And in fact, he, 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 as far as we know, until the Roman Empire came, he created the biggest empire of, of his time. It stretched all the way up into Asia Minor, went down to India, encompassed all the, the Middle East and, and, and parts of, of Africa and certainly the Promised Land there. Cyrus took it all and he plundered it all, Babylon and, and all the rest of them. Uh, if I remember correctly my history, and you'll have to fact check me on this one, I think he actually assembled 200 tons of gold in his maraudings and in, in his wars. Became fabulously wealthy there. But all that aside was, all that was allowed, in fact, God says, I'm going to do it for him. I'm going to break the, bon the bronze gates. I'm going to cut the bars of iron. I'm going to let him do all this for one reason, because he's going to say, bring the people back and build the city again. He's going to be the unwitting, if you would, servant of God. That's why he's called the shepherd, which is a strange, by the way, a very strange designation. You know, the only, who else gets called the shepherd? The Lord Jesus in the New Testament. And here in the Old Testament, this unbelieving king is called the shepherd because he is being used as a tool of God to promote and to do his will in this world. So when we look at the world around us, we see this obscurity in the, this, the, verse 15, this hiddenness of God. And we have to accept it as the people of God. And we have to live with that tension in our lives that there's going to be all kinds of things that happen in the world around us, catastrophic things even. And we cannot see What's happening in them all? And yet we must be convinced, I do think we need to be convinced and believe that God is firmly has his hand on all of those things. And that someday, just as we can look back now thousands of years later on the, the Jerusalem uh, Cyrus situation, and we can see, oh, Yes, that did work out the way God wanted it to work out. Yes, that did ultimately bring the kingdom of God back onto track, brought the people back to the land so that the promised Messiah could be born in Bethlehem there in the house of David and he could become our Savior today. These mysterious workings are, uh, you know, Isaiah just has to bow his face to the ground. And we have to as well. So you have that part of providence on one hand, but, but we, we don't want to think of that as being the only part of providence because if we think that way, we, we could fall off into a dualism thinking, well, there's just good and evil. That's what happens to some people. They see all the evil and they say, uh, well, there must be a good God, but there must be an evil force out there too of equally powerful uh, intent because of all the things that are happening. No, it's just the secret way in which God works. But in that same text there, in addition to what he says in verse 15, truly you are a God who hides himself, then you have to drop down to verse 19 to catch the other half of God's providential dealings and thinking. In verse 19 it says, I did not speak in secret in a land of darkness. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. 
I declare what is right. So at the same time that we see, broadly speaking, the, the secretive work of God in the world, at the same time he is saying, but when it comes to the necessaries, I speak very plainly and clearly in this world. So you have these sort of two sides, two phases of, of the manifestation of God's providence. Obscurity for, in some respects, but clarity for the things that we need to know and for our salvation. Now let me just talk about those for a few minutes here. Of this obscurity. There is, this, there is an aspect in which we can say and we see coming through in this particular passage that, that God is hidden in his workings. And even nature teaches that because nature reveals and hides at the same time. God gets concealed in, in what we call second causes in nature. We, we, we don't always see what he's doing. We just see the results of that taking place in the world. Uh, he's concealed behind the regular laws of nature. I mean, that's why the scientists today are so confused because they just see the laws of nature going on and working and, and, and you know, springtime and harvest and the sun going around, I mean, the, the, the earth going around the sun and, and turning around in a circle and all these regular things that happen we, we see in nature that we don't, then we tend to think, or some people tend to think, well, then God must not be active. It's just all these laws doing their things. But nature only declares a fragment of what God is doing. And nature's, even nature's testimony is, is ambiguous because in, in, in all the good things that we see in nature, we also see all the evil things that are happening. We see the death. We see, uh, earthquake in Morocco this week. Thousand people dead. You know, floods in Greece. I don't know how many people are dead there. You know, and on and on it goes. Nature gives us this, this uh, we might say, almost a little bit schizophrenic view of the world there. And so there are, 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 that's what, one way in which God is sort of hidden in this world. And then also in his workings of providence, he doesn't reveal all. I mean, and, and sometimes it seems a bit confusing to us. I mean, how can we, how can God use Cyrus of all people? Why would he use a wicked man? And we could multiply that out to all kinds of people and men and circumstances there. And we don't see his working. And, and that, that can be a stumbling block to some people. And even when we think of the grace of God, we don't see all things clearly. I mean, look at if infinity and eternity. Do you know what that is? Can you really grasp that as a finite human being? Can you describe to me and tell to me what it means to live forever and ever, what it means to be unlimited in, in your space and, and in your, your ability to be everywhere at the same time. We, it goes beyond us. In the, these sorts of ways, we can understand that phrase there, truly you are a God who hides himself. I'm, I'm not saying that God intentionally hides himself, but he's just so great that we cannot encompass all that he is and all that he is doing in this world. 
And the, the part of our problem is the, the more we know in the, about God, the more we expect to know, and then we, we, we find that we run out of our own abilities. And some people insist on knowing more than what God has been willing to reveal or even can reveal to finite people in this world. So the, so the prophet says, truly you are a God who hides yourself. But in the midst of that, we take comfort in verse 19. I did not speak in secret in the land of darkness. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. So in that, whatever we may think about the, the hiddenness of God and the, 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 the murkiness of his workings in providence, he says to us as his people, but I am speaking to you clearly. The things that you need to know. When, when I say, seek me, that's an open statement. So we don't need to worry about all of the, the, the obscurities of providence because what is important for us to know, God has let us know. Uh, I, there's phrases in, in our text there where he talks about uh, saving Israel forever, about the righteousness of of God like rain falling from the heavens and sprouting up on the, on the earth. That's clear, beloved. And, of course, it's even more clear to us than it was to Isaiah because we know where that righteous rain comes down onto the earth or how it comes down to the earth. How does it come down? In the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who rains down righteousness from heaven and sprouts up with the gospel out of the earth so that people now from every tribe and from every language and from every nation are knowing the one true God, are able to hear his call to not seek him in vain, but to openly come to him But there's that one, I, I, I want to just in closing look at that one verse there, verse 9. Because I think it describes our struggle in this matter. In verse 9 it says, Woe to him who strives with him who formed him, a pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making, or your work has no handles? That's us, beloved. See, when we look around at the world, and, and, and let's, let's not even consider the world, but we, we, we look at our own circumstances of life and the struggles that arise and the problems that come to us, we're tempted to find ourselves right here at verse 9, like the pot saying to the potter, what are you doing? I wanted handles, and you just made me plain. I wanted this, and you gave me that. I wanted prosperity, and you sent calamity into my life. Do you hear yourself saying that sometimes? That's very much the human condition. That whatever God does, we object to it. And we need to be repentant of that kind of attitude towards the working of God in this world. Instead, we need to say, God, you do what you know is best. And I will agree with you that whatever you do, 
is ultimately the best. Even using a wicked man like Cyrus, which we can't see as being the best solution to the problem, was the right solution. And whatever comes into your life, in that regard, that you don't understand from the workings of God, don't be the pot that says, why are you doing this? Why are you making my life like this? Instead, be the one who is obedient to the will of God, who is, who is humbled under the hand of God, who is willing to listen and to, to, to be overcome by whatever it is that God is placing in our lives. Clarity and obscurity, <laughs> both at the same time. That's what, that's what the Christian life is for us, beloved, and will always be right up to the very end until we have the ultimate clarity of heaven. We'll live with this paradox of life within the scope of our sight and within the scope of our own experience. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask that, that we would be your willing servants, not just tools, but willing children. Not some Cyrus, but an Isaiah, a Daniel, a Jeremiah. Those who, who follow you willingly and gladly, no matter what happens in the circumstances of life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.